Hello, and thank you for joining us for the SLW Institute webinar, DOCX Filing, Submitter Beware. A recording of this webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Feel free to enter any questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom menu. We invite you to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. Our speakers today will be Brad Forrest and Casey Grover. Brad is a patent attorney with Schwegman Lundberg & Wissner and has been diving into DOCX for the past year and a half and having several discussions with the USPTO via APLA. Casey Grover is a US paralegal at Schwegman Lundberg & Wissner. Casey has been assisting in using the training mode for examples and working side by side with Brad to uncover issues and problems with DOCX. And with that, I'll turn things over to Brad and Casey. All right, thank you, Michelle, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna try something different uh, after this uh, webinar with uh, an after party. And uh, think of it as a therapy session to talk about how we feel after this presentation and uh, for any further questions, if you'd like to ask them orally as opposed to just using the, the chat button to ask questions. Uh, Casey will be monitoring that chat button too. And we'll try to answer questions as we go along uh, as well as afterward. There's the QR code. Anyway, we'll show that at the end too. All right. Um, as, as many of you know, because you signed up, the US Patent Office is requiring you to file using DOCX file starting January 1, 2022, or pay an extra fee for not using DOCX of $400 if you're a large entity, 200 for small, 100 for micro entity. Um, it, what, and why DOCX? Why does the Patent Office want DOCX? And what is DOCX? Right, so DOCX is just that, that little extension at the end of a, of a document file name that uh, says, okay, store this in a format that includes little tags that tell you what to do to display the document. Uh, think of it like hashtag indent, hashtag paragraph. Those little things are, are put inside the source file, the docx file, and it tells the word processor, no matter which one, you can use any word processor, and, and most of them now will process files and store files as docx files. I got into this um, as chair of the American Intellectual Property Law, uh, AIPLA Patent Relations with the USPTO Committee. I was chairing that and the, a new fee rule came out and we had to generate comments uh, for the AIPLA to submit to the patent office to tell them what we thought of DOCX as well as all the other fees, uh, filing in DOCX that is. Um, that's the only reason I got sucked into that and somehow became uh, an expert and uh, you know tried to advocate for for you know, patent attorneys everywhere, even as well as AIPLA members, um, to help make this transition as smooth as possible. Uh, I, I know most of us wanted to ignore it and continue working the way we were because it was working. You know, we were filing things and uh, everything seemed to work out fine. So the DOCX surcharge will apply to all uh, 111A filings. It does not apply to provisional applications uh, or national stage applications out of 371. Uh, Casey has helped me in testing uh, the, the test system uh, and, in Patent Center at the USPTO, and later on she will be providing a, a short demonstration of how to do it, right? But today we're going to first talk about uh, what it is, I talked about that a little bit, um, what some of the problems can be, how DOCX files can look different based on the system that displays it, you know, which, is, which is problematic because you'd like to make sure that what you see on your computer is the same thing that gets filed in the patent office. Um, we're all for innovation and um, you know, I applaud the USPTO for, for uh, you know, trying to obtain 
tag-based techs. Uh, it makes their systems much more efficient. It, they can share documents uh, around the world much more easily. Um, they can do their job more easily too. Uh, but you know, innovation comes uh, with a, a price. You have to be careful when you innovate, especially in, in filing patent applications, which we need to be as perfect as possible. And you don't want innovation to get in the way of filing a good patent application. So uh, as a firm, I mean, we started going electronic uh, and capturing images of things filed back in 1998. We had an internal system and, and we selected paper port as the file format. Well, nobody's heard of that today. Uh, we had to switch partway through and, and go to a PDF. And a PDF, everyone's pretty familiar with now. And PDF is now an actual standard. And a PDF will look exactly like you see it on your computer. And that's part of the standard and, and why we are now all comfortable filing using PDFs. I, I, just a, a brief history of filing patent applications. I mean, I, when I started, we, we typed things out on paper. We had drawings that had to be on a particular type of paper called vellum, and they had to use India ink. And you would either mail it or hand carry it to the patent office. Uh, then express mail came along and that was great. Now, you know, we, we just get the, the US pat or the uh, postal service to stamp it as, hey, we received it on this day. And I remember one, one day years ago in, uh, when I worked uh, with IBM in Rochester, Minnesota, it was getting too late and the post office was closed when I got there and I went around to the back docks and actually had them stamp my, uh, and get the receipt that my application was submitted via express mail. And they said, well, you know, it won't get there tomorrow. I said, I don't care if it gets there next week. I just need this stamp, you know? So we're, attorneys are pretty particular about what they file. Uh, the patent office had a brief flirtation with XML documents. That's extended markup language. And, and think of those uh, very similar. It's like uh, tag-based filing, uh, tag-based stuff that I talked about before. But this time, the patent office wanted the labels of, you know, hashtag summary, uh, hashtag claims, hashtag abstract. And you had to actually put those into your application to file it. That failed. And they went to the EFS, which we all use today. It uses that PDF that we're all very familiar with. Um, one that we create the one that's the applicant that the inventor has proofed and looked at and everyone's fine with that, okay? But now we can't use that as of January, 2022, and we have to file using a docx file. Now uh, that's not what the inventor reviewed and docx can display differently on different systems. It, it doesn't, you know, it, it, usually it's pretty good. Uh, but if you have special formulas, special symbols and things like that, that's where most of the problems occur. And we will show you some of those problems after um, Casey does the demo. Uh, all right. And, and why do we care about what we file is, is actually what we think we're filing. You know, and here it is, the author declaration, the inventor can go to jail if something's filed, you know, if they make a willful false statement that uh, this is what I'm filing and it's not filed. Um, and if DOCX changes it, that oath must remain applicable after the alterations that were made by the US Patent Office system. So it, we care. Um, it may be an unrecoverable error if um, you, know, you, you don't have support in the application for what you're claiming. So the process, um, I'll give a quick brief overview before I turn it over to Casey, but if you really wanna get more details on the process, we're not gonna dive into it in huge detail today. Uh, the PTO is training weekly and the next seminar that they have is uh, scheduled for this Monday after the weekend. Um, the only problem I have with the training so far is they don't warn you about you know, the possible errors that it might look differently. I've, I've asked them to, and we'll see if that happens in the future. But it's a fairly simple process and the patent office has actually worked to make it easier. You used to have to submit 
three DOCX documents, dividing out the claims, dividing out the abstract, and dividing out the spec into three separate documents. You don't have to anymore. They, they figured out how now you can just do it with one document. So you navigate to the patent center and you should all have accounts there, uh, patent practitioners and uh, you know, paralegal should be sponsored by, by the attorneys or, or practitioners, uh, patent agents included. Um, and, and you select a new submission, you load the docx of the specification. You also load a PDF of the drawings and the application data sheet, the ADS. And uh, I'm assuming many, most of you know these TLAs or three letter acronyms, so I won't uh, you know, spell them out going forward. Then you click a button that says, okay, the DOCX document that I saw in the USPS, USPTO display or generated display, that is the document of record. That is exactly what I'm filing. Um, that changed with the final rule in June of 2021. It used to be the PDF that they created from that document. Um, that is no longer, it now is the actual DOCX document. And you know, we just hope that you proofed it well before the system timed out. Uh, Casey will now uh, demonstrate how to commit malpractice. I, I, I mean, how to file in Patent Center using DOCX files. And she's going to, uh, in the demo, there is, uh, it was created with a contrived application with lots of problems in it to test the system, like misnumbered claims and things like that. And the system does do a good job of, of catching some of those types of mistakes. You know? So there is also benefit to filing in, in DOCX. So, all right, take it away, Casey. Okay, so um, this is the Patent Center homepage. Um, essentially, if you haven't been able to use it for other filings, um, it, it is very user friendly. It's the dashboards are pretty easy to manage. Um, so there's a link if you'd like to go in and kind of mess around with it. Um, the next slide will show you how we get into making the pair function. So if you wanted to search and find the pair copy, that's in there. And then these are your buttons, the submission functions for new submissions, petitions, post grant. Um, you can find a, kind of find your own way. At the, all the way to the bottom of the Patent Center homepage is where you'd find the training mode um, access. If you're logged in under your account, you will need to log out. It will not let you access the training mode while you're logged in, um, which I believe is a really good fail safe to have in case you do actually or accidentally submit something. Um, and there's a lot of quick start and training guides on the Patent Center website along with those trainings to attend. Uh, they are rather lengthy, but they do do a good overview of what you need to know to get you started in Patent Center and in the training mode. So the next slide should be our specific um, demonstration and what we did when we went in uh, with our test applications. So you'll go in and submit a new application. You can choose how to file with your ADS. Uh, a web form, uploading a fill fillable form or a PDF. Um, and then this is where you'll enter and drag and drop your DOCX document along with your document for drawings. As you'll see here, it will indicate the what they are. It should tag or label your drawings or you'll need to drop down and do that yourself. When you submit the DOCX, it should recognize, as Brad said, the different parts of the application, the specification claims and abstracts. When it goes into the system, this is where it will trigger warnings and errors, depending on the actual content of the document. So in this instance, we uploaded a DOCX filing and it triggered an error and it triggered warnings. An error will prevent you from filing the red um, banner so in this case, our application had a hyperlink embedded in the Word document. Um, it will also then trigger if there are figure numbers that haven't that are out of order, haven't been detected, if the claims don't appear to be in sequential order. Um, in order to access what those errors are or where the warnings are in the document, you'll have to click this blue indication of feedback document. That will produce and download a DOCX rendering of your application you submitted, and it will have balloons 
indicating where each warning or each error is in the document. Um, so this is where a, um, an example of how that will look to you. So it'll have a summary at the top of your document saying an independent claim count and where your warnings are. The specification paragraph numbering is not consecutive, eight instances. And you can go down and find each instance within the application that the system has flagged. Um, so it's pretty user-friendly. It does have a lot of really good capabilities depending on the type of content you're submitting or how much you would like it to review. Um, we did have a few instances where we could not necessarily pinpoint where the warning was coming from. Um, and those are the instances where we're getting cautious and we're trying to alert and find how to manipulate the system. So when you get to the final page before hitting your submit, you've reviewed the feedback document, you believe you're ready to go. The red circle indicates when, you're click, when you click submit, you agree that the, to accept the DOCX validations as your final submission. So this is where we are unsure how the document will render and come out on the other end based on our review of the feedback documents. Um, it's, but basically that's all you get in the slew of um, information you're trying to download, preview, double check before you submit, you get a tiny banner in the middle of the screen that says you're agreeing to accept our rendering as your final submission. All right. Now, once, once you've submitted it, um, the patent office will actually generate a hash of the docx file. Uh, again, that's the hash of, you know, the underlying document, not the display of the document. And you can actually gen use your own hash generator. You know, what is a hash? A hash is just something that it's a function that you, you input a whole bunch of text and it generates a unique number that says, okay, anything else with the identical test will generate that same unique number. Right, and then that gives you, it's supposed to give you some assurance that, okay, what, what I filed is exactly what I thought I was filing. Except, like I said, the rendering or the display of the docx file may still vary depending on the platform. Your hashes can match, but you know, don't, don't rely on that, you, you can't. Um, and the real problem is if a formula is missing or mangled, you know, have you got enablement? Yeah, maybe that particular formula is the key to the invention, like uh, the, the equation in, uh, you know, diamond v. deer for opening the rubber press. Um, what about inequitable conduct? Now, all of a sudden, you're filing something that the inventor didn't approve if that equation is, is mangled. That's, that's not good. And uh, the malpractice uh, insurance, uh, our, our malpractice uh, broker is actually not very happy with this system uh, because there, there may be increased claims and uh, that will result in increased premiums down the road. All right. Um, uh, again, you, you may not have a whole lot of time to review the DOCX file. Um, you know, if you're staring at one screen for a while, it, uh, it may time out. Um, you can save submissions. You could, you could save them and have them reviewed by the inventor. Um, but then, you know, when you go back in, hope the code didn't change in between and now it displays slightly differently. Um, and, and attorneys are pretty well known for, you know, filing with plenty of time to spare, like, you know, several days before um, an on sale bar or something like that. So that, that was slightly sarcastic, but. So our testing has shown that most formulas and chemical drawings using ChemDraw come out just fine. A lot of people have been testing this system. Uh, <clears throat> Carl Apadal was an early beta tester. Uh, he's got a blog on many of the other issues that have been discovered. Uh, recommend going there if you're, if you're concerned and, and worried about that. Like Casey mentioned, some things can be very hard to find, like a hidden URL prevented filing using DOCX, created an error. 
in the test mode, it didn't identify where that URL was. And, and we searched all over the place to find it. Um, finally, I consulted directly with a programmer at the USPTO and, and they were able to help find it. Um, uh, there was a difference between testing mode, mode and submitting mode at that time too. Um, so that, that can be problematic as well. So again, you know, the, the fundamental problem is that DocX was designed to adapt for each computer that it renders a document on. And others have found that pagination can change. And, and the big deal is non-Microsoft shops, you know, uh, free software, other word processing programs are likely to encounter bigger differences in the displayed document. There is a limited number of fonts supported by DocX, and uh, I've got those in the very last slide to show you. Uh, and that support is subject to change without notice. Um, if you're really into this, and I don't want to be, uh, because I don't want to be an expert in word processing. I, I want to draft patent applications and, and have them look exactly like I think they're you know, going to be filed. Um, it, but if you're into trying to figure out how to use extra stuff, there are plugins. Well, uh, and you can't even use plugins and additional settings, you know, if, if you really are deep into word processing. All right. <clears throat> one, uh, one interesting note is we actually had a case where, you know, I, I've, I've been harping that Documents can display differently on different systems. It even happened within our firm. Um, it's, it's happened when I've exchanged documents with inventors, right? And they come back and say, hey, paragraph 12, this is wrong. And I go, no, that's paragraph 13. You know, so something happened in there that, that doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort. Um, software will change over time. All the word processors out there, they're constantly being updated, modified, you never know when an error is going to be introduced like that. There's a program called LaTeX that is used for research papers. And I've had a lot of applications where I get a research paper and it's got a lot of formulas in it. Um, that's where a lot of errors are going to occur because special symbols, special uh, you know, variables, things like that, that you know, are in a different font uh, that, because other fonts simply don't support that type of uh, symbol, right? They will be used in, in these research papers. And you, know, you, you can't just cut and paste into your document because that will change. And the real, you know, uh, I guess looking to the future, right? There are new inventions coming all the time. And the English language does not, you know, it, it's flexible. You can change it to cover uh, the expression of new concepts, right? How do you describe new things? I mean, inventors are their own lexicographers. They invent new words. They invent, you know, new new formats of text to try and show how inventions work, right? And so, you know, we've got all these new things coming at us and, and DocX and the USPTO, they're, they're just not designed to anticipate every new way that you have to express something. All right, yeah. And, and here's an example, right? Pseudocode. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit just for your torture, I guess. But, um, you know, software wasn't around before, you know, 70s. It, it really exploded in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, back then we expressed software with flowcharts, right? It was part of the drawings, okay? No problem. But then, you know, nobody does flowcharts anymore. We invented a new way to describe code and it's called pseudocode. And here's an example, right? Now the formatting of the pseudocode is, is really important. Here's the doc that we submitted, right? In this area here. Now this happens to be what we call a nested loop. You've got all these operations here that are performed and you, you know, first you set this loop, here's the outer loop from from for i, and then here's an inner loop for j. So when i is one and j is one, you do this w times. You know, you don't have to follow all this, but just understand. And then you go back and then you change i to two, and then you go through this all again and do this 
this loop of code several times. So they're one nested inside the other. That format expresses it very well. It, it shows you how these are nested. Now in USPO, USPTO docx version, this is what came out. Now you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out how, you know, what's really going on there, uh, but it, it's very difficult. Now, I, I did communicate this example to the programmer at the patent office, and they did fix this example. Uh, I, don't, I don't have confidence that every example like that will be fixed. And the funny thing is, in this one, uh, which was strange, there's an end and an end in the same line. And uh, at the time, the, the USPTO was using uh, generating a PDF that you had to approve. And all of a sudden, everything looks kind of like that docx document from the USPTO, but the end shifted back another line. And, and you know, I'm, I'm guessing there was probably some margin thing that caused that problem. But anyway, so next, the USPTO did integrate this very well with ChemDraw. ChemDraw works quite well. Uh, and you know, we haven't seen any problems with ChemDraw so far. But for people that don't use DocX, here is an example. I think uh, Carl helped put this together and it was some in some of the original comments back to the patent office. Um, there can be different page breaks that result if it was prepared using LibreOffice and then emailed to DocX to Office 365, different indents, different spaces, the fonts rendered differently, right? And the math formula, this is the one that, that really goofed up because here the exponent is zero and here the exponent is 10. That's quite a huge difference. Yeah, my, my guess as a programmer in a way, way past life is that uh, the program somehow thought this was a one. It inserted it down in front of the zero. And then it went back and said, oh, there's a closed paren here. There must be one, an open paren over here, one that starts over here. So I better add that in too. You know, so we can't count on software to be smart for us and, and figure things out correctly. Here's an example that, that we found in you know, like paragraph you know, 274 in, in the text, not on a separate line, right? You've got the, the what we, submitted what displayed on our system. It included the var multiple varial, variables, symbols, things like that. It displayed down here as everything was a rectangle. Yeah, that, that does not help you much. And this was, you know, there was no warning, no error. If there was an error, it would prevent you from filing. If it was a warning, it would give you a chance to find it, correct it, right? Casey, I see there's a ton of chat and uh, Q and A up there. So you know, if, you, if you're seeing any of that, let me know. Here, here's another example uh, I got from another attorney. Um, there was some problem with some style somewhere. I, I don't know. Again, I don't want to be a word processing expert to try and figure out. Okay, what what's a style? I just you know I, I just use the paragraph numbering, which you do have to use for DocX to submit it that way in the patent office. Um, again, not in an abstract though, but here the abstract, it created an error and you cannot file that application. You have to revert to a PDF or go back and try and figure it out if you have time and fix it. Adds a lot of time and expense, not a good thing. So here's some errors that we've encountered. The, Casey mentioned the hidden hyperlink. We could not find that anywhere. It, it did, I mean, it just did, did not appear uh, when reading the application. Uh, it was like 70, 80 page application. And the programmer at the USPTO said, well, maybe if you use function nine, uh, that'll reveal it in Microsoft Word. I, I don't really want to know that. Um, I just want it to work. Uh, that, that, that was fixed. Um, there was an unrecognizable font error associated with the chemical equation. You know, while the images of the, of the um, uh, chemicals work out fine, um, there was something that caused us not to be able to file, an error. These things prevent filing, they're hard to find. Another one, you know, like the abstract before, conclusion on a separate line prevented filing. You know, we're, we're gonna keep coming up with new ways to, to screw up the rendering by the patent office, believe me. And uh, I, always, I always use the phrase when you're 
when you're trying to create a perfect system, you know, you make it as foolproof as you can, but they keep coming up with better fools. So, all right, we had a PDF result in blank pages and programmer that I worked with said that's been fixed too. Um, then we ended up with a temporary system resource constraint and that got fixed, but the hyperlink error returned. Um, okay, we finally got that resolved, but that's a lot to go through. All right, to, to, just to be able to file something and avoid that $400 fee. Then um, doing all this stuff too, uh, you know, lots of people were reporting errors, uh, but they didn't, you couldn't, they couldn't give them the actual error because I know there have been FOIA, Freedom of Information Access requests made to the patent office. And I don't want my client confidential information uh, becoming public through, through a FOIA. It, it just doesn't make sense. So we've had to actually modify applications where we found problems to try and recreate the problem and then turn that into the patent office. So that's been a lot of work. And, and again, Casey has been great in helping out with all that stuff. All right, is DOCX compatible with the way you are currently filing your applications, right? And it may require some significant revision to it. And I'd like to go through some things that, you know, hopefully you can, you, you can do to figure out, but here's, here's kind of our process, right? Inventor approves a PDF of the application, but again, that's not what you file. You have to file DOCX, right? And I, I really can't get the inventor to, you know, sign on at the same time as our paralegal is filing the document and review it in real time along with the attorney. Um, you, you just don't have that time and the inventors don't have that availability. And, you know, if you have a lot of inventors on the application, that's even tougher. Um, but how do you change your existing process? I mean, I've heard some attorneys, um, they are so concerned that the inventor has reviewed the application, right? That they have the inventor initial and date each page, right? We, I had to do that when I, when I created a will, right? Or had one created, but I, I'm not sure how you can do that with a DOCX filing, you know, unless the inventor is there, but then you can't like have them modify it after they've already signed the declaration. So, uh, you know, it becomes, uh, problematic in, in modifying your existing processes. So, and, and how do you proof it, right? Who does the proofing? It's just, it's a difficult process here. So, you know, we're kind of left with, okay, how can we make our patent applications DOCX proof in ways, right? Um, right. And, you know, I, I've brought these issues forward to the patent office as well. I, I spoke with the uh, you know, director of the OED. Um, the response was, hey, if you follow a good process, you should be okay. You know, we're not gonna open an investigation on you. And uh, the malpractice plaintiff might not be so nice uh, was my response. So, all right. Now, before you completely, you know, before Patent Center becomes fantastic and we trust it as much as we now trust a PDF, uh, we, we came up with a number of ways to get around it and other people have, have come up with others as well. Um, one is to, to try a, a same day provisional application in the PDF without a fee, right? It's an extra step, uh, you know, and then, then you would, when you are, DOCX document, you specifically claim priority to that provisional application and then file it using DOCX. And proof the DOCX closely within two months of filing. If there's errors, you know, pay the provisional fee and claim priority. And submit a preliminary amendment and, you know, you should be okay. Now, the one thing I recommend, even if you, you know, file the provisional application is use images of formulas in the DOCX document, you know, cut and paste them from source documents, uh, images as well. If it's a PDF that you get from the inventor and enlarge that image of the formula because there's exponents and subscripts and superscripts. But when the patent office stores it, right, they will be reducing the resolution of that image to 300 by 300 dots per inch for storage. Right, and that can obscure 
exponents and things like that if it's too small. So, you know, some of my applications look pretty weird because I've got a formula that it's about two inches high. And I just want to make sure everything in it is going to be clear when I file it. All right. So provisional application, right? I mean, we talked about that in the last slide. That might not help you because internationally, right? Now you can correct an obvious error. But again, if you look at that formula that had boxes instead of the actual variables and symbols, um, I don't think that qualifies as an obvious error. So you may not actually be able to correct that because you can't incorporate by reference internationally in many countries. So if you get a different result in different countries, you're playing with fire there. Um, the US priority claim has to be present at filing, right? And you can burn up $400 worth or 200 of protective, protective measures fairly quickly. So what, what are we doing? Um, in our firm, we're actually going to start live testing very quickly. This makes Casey very nervous. Um, and we're, we're gonna do it in a, in a particular way that uh, we're going to try and pick applications to begin with that don't have formulas and are, you know, hopefully like under 20 pages. Uh, we probably don't file too many of those, but let's, let's start with those. We'll file them early in the morning. And then hopefully we'll get a pair copy back the same day. Uh, I know that's, that's iffy at times. Um, and then we will have that proofed by people who proof things really well, right? And, and then we'll feel comfortable. And if, if there's problems, we'll just uh, you know, file a PDF and, and not pay the fee in the original case. We'll, we'll file the original missing parts through DOCX. All right, so, um, you know, I've been working on this for almost two years now. I've had a, a lot of meetings with the USPTO, the programmers, the, um, the executives there, um, as, as well as, um, you know, recently with Drew Hirschfeld, the, the acting director and, um, we, what we've asked for um, is to allow a PDF to be used to correct the document of record. So get the, the, get the PDF that the inventor approved and signed off on. And, and if we can add that or include that too in the filing um, and use that down the road and make that actually the priority document, then, then we can correct it later if we have to, right? Or, you know, uh, or we asked, hey, maybe you could just reduce or eliminate the fee for non-DOCX filing because the admitted cost in the rule was $3.15 per application. So the, what this tells you is that the patent office really, really wants everyone to file using DOCX. It, it makes their job easier. As I said, their systems are designed to accommodate it, uh, to use it. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's, I think, what we're going to be stuck with, you know, absent uh, some other events happening. Now, you know, I, recently uh, another attorney in another firm said, well, hey, we get Japanese applications. They're in Japanese. We get them like the day of. We have to file them emergency, but, you know, right, same day in Japanese and then later follow up with the English translation. And he said, if we can get them in DOCX, but boy, look out there. You know, I, I think you would generate a lot of errors trying to file that, and even if you were successful, um, you know, but why should there be a fee for filing that application that day as a PDF? Because the patent office does not want to use the, the actual source text in a Japanese document, right? It doesn't do them any good at all. They're, they're going to use, you know, the, the document you file later. Right, and so why charge that $400 fee? So I'm not sure that everything was thought through thoroughly in, in this yet. Um, and I do wanna you know, end with, with one thing is that um, in, in the meeting with Drew and I guess at, at lunch at AIPLA last Friday at the annual meeting, uh, Drew Hirschfeld, uh, I, I heard that he said that uh, they will um, delay the, the start date for the requirement for the DOCX filing fee uh, if you don't file with DOCX. 
So there, there is good news and there is hope on the horizon. Uh, however, I haven't seen anything official on that yet, but uh, you know, we're, we're still fighting for you. All right, I promised the, uh, the list of fonts for DocX and uh, I blame this formatting file on DocX right here. You know, not lined up very well, but that's probably not the case. Um, so thank you uh, so much. And I guess if there's any questions, we'll take those now. And uh, I'll give you a teaser for the next topic that I uh, have been diving into. And that is the dangers of customer numbers and sponsorships in Patent Center. I'll give you a little teaser on that. Whenever um, uh, a, a patent practitioner or paralegal enters your firm or leaves your firm, make sure you've got all those uh, customer numbers and sponsorships, you know, erased from previous, uh, you know, when they go to another firm, make sure they don't take those with them because that other firm will then be able to view everything that a paralegal who went there is sponsored by an attorney who's still in your firm. And that's not a good thing. All right. I guess I'll, uh, Casey, are you still on? I'm here. Um, the majority of the chat questions I believe were discussed and um, overviewed by our presentation. There's a couple with relation to the hash for, what do you mean by comparing the hash for the filed copy versus the original? Um, if you wanted to delve in on that a little bit more. And also they were wondering about DocX um, and their compatibility with older versions of, of um, Word I know we had some issues when we went to the DocX not supporting previous versions of Word. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about how the hash works. I just know that I don't want to trust it. And and so I I, I guess I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't even pay attention to the hash. Um, you you really have to look at what the ending document of record is in the USPTO and compare it to what you intended to file. You know, um, and, and I don't think the hash will help you there. I, I just wouldn't rely on it at all. And, and that's a very good point about older versions of word processors. Um, who knows, right? Uh, again, um, it, you're probably best with the most up-to-date, but it, it can get you on either end, right? An update to a new program can cause problems as well. I, I just don't know. Uh, that's why we're being very, very careful. It also looks like a lot of people are asking about um, the, you were talking about having same day PDF filings um, with missing parts. So filing same day with um, no fee payment and then letting it go abandoned. Um, do you have any comment on that? I believe, you know, it's the same premise where how much work do we want to do for this one filing just to avoid a $400 fee? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, all, all these precautions you can take are just going to add up pretty quickly. And uh, I haven't found a lot of clients out there that want to, uh, you know, increase their budget by, you know, three to three to 10% by paying the $400 fee, you know, for each application. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just scanning through uh, some of the questions here. Any reason you can't also submit a confirmatory PDF specification for support in addition to the DOCX? Um, that was a, a, a good question there. That's, that's exactly what we want to be able to do. And we, we were kind of, you know, peeved, I guess, is a, a gentle way of saying it when uh, we had been suggesting that to the patent office and uh, the final rule came out and it said, if you try to submit a PDF as well, we may charge you the DOCX, non-DOCX filing you know, fee. We thought, wow, really? Um, so that, that would have been a great solution and that's the solution we're trying for. And I actually have a lot of hope that, that we will be able to submit that PDF. Um, 
Oh, but can we file a PDF of the application as a miscellaneous incoming letter? So we have some backup support. Um, you know, I, I doubt they would work or that would work. Um, you know, and do, do you want to risk <laughs> everything on that? Um, right, okay, I, I addressed the thoughts about including uh, formulas or, you know, pseudocode blocks as an image. Yep, that's, and, and that's exactly what we do. And we enlarge the image because of the down resolution in the patent office. Um, I've also seen questions on EFS versus Patent Center. Um, as far as I know, we haven't done a lot of beta testing in EFS just due to the lack of a training mode. Um, however, you can still do the same and it should produce the same type of scenarios that you saw on our slides, such as obtaining a feedback document to see where your errors and warnings are in the document um, and also filing in PDF form in there. So as of right now, you can still continue to operate as normal for filing your applications via PDF. This is just our testing and what we've been able to accomplish while we've been trying to get ahead of the curve for DOCX filing that seems to be being pushed in imminent um, at some point. Yeah, one question, can you not upload the DOCX spec, print to PDF, and then send the PDF to inventors for review? Um, so the difficulty there is that the, the DOCX spec, you know, will display differently on the USPTO system, right? And so all, all you're basically, you, you know, that, that actually won't work because the, the PDF that you get, um, you know, it, I don't know if there's a way to do that or not, right? I mean, if the USPTO still generates a PDF, I, I suppose you could send that to the inventors for review if you have the time. You know, most, many attorneys do not have that uh, luxury of time, at least the ones, the ones that I know. And, uh, but, you know, basically, ever since uh, we, we've been in a first to file mode for like 30 years. So as soon as it's ready, you want to file it as fast as you can. Um, you know, that's, that's just reality today. Uh, and so anything that adds extra time to the process, not a good thing, uh, especially if it's just a, a matter of administration, right? And, and getting the patent office a copy in you know, readable text. Others have been suggesting that, hey, why not just a text readable PDF? Uh, you know, and, and that might've been a good thing. And, you know, well, I, I hope if, if, you know, at some point um, the patent office can, can figure out that, hey, you know, I guess we can just do text recognition on the PDF and have better software to convert it to the, the stuff that we need. Right, um, that that would be the ideal from the user point of view, but apparently they've they've tried that. They have difficulties. Like I don't know if you've tried to cut and paste from a PDF, where all of a sudden the page numbers and footers come in. And, you know, it, it's not an easy thing to do manually, but it just seems like software should be able to be written uh, to do that. Has anyone tried legislative lobbying to stop this madness? Is another question. Um, that's that was. You know, it, it's on a back burner. It was in the works. Um, that's, that's about as much as I can say on that. Um, but it, we, we think with our, you know, our work with Drew uh, Hirschfeld and things like that, that things are, are looking up a bit. And then talking about evidentiary copies a bit, you know, basically the evidentiary copy is, hey, this is what you filed, period, right? That's, that's all you have. They call it an evidentiary copy, uh, the document of record, the priority document. Those are all kind of the same things, but you know, it's, it's just evidence of this is what you filed, that when, this is what you agreed to when you hit submit. It's that contract that, you know, what, uh, what do you call it? Like a shrink wrap contact or contract or, you know, contract of adhesion, right? You hit the submit button and you're done. Okay, um, I don't recommend DocX software for Mac users. I'm not familiar with that. Um, 
All right, what else? Uh, someone has gotten warning mes messages um, that there are OLE objects that are unsupported. No indication how to fix that warning. Doesn't prevent submission, so it just makes sure they're accurate. Um, yeah, so the USPTO docx, um, WIPO is, is experimenting with the same docx thing now. I've heard rumors that they're encountering problems as well. And we actually asked the patent office to check with WIPO on that. Haven't really heard back yet. Um, yeah, at, at one point, they were going to purge docx documents for retention reasons. Um, but I don't think they're going to do that anymore now that they have made that the document of record uh, with that final rule in June. Um, <laughs> if the client doesn't want to pay the $400 fee, will they pay the law firm's fees for meeting all the DOCX requirements? I can't answer that one. Um, anyone else on the call wants to put in a chat, you know, feel free to. Um, Downsides besides the fee is there to filing in PDF. Uh, we all do it that way now. Uh, I, I can't think of any. Uh, is the ADS filed as a PDF? Um, Casey, you got that one? It's a, a readable PDF, right? Yes. So currently there's three ways to submit an ADS and those um, are not pertinent. They have no bearing on if you submit your specification claims and abstract as a docx. So you can still choose to submit your ADS as a web-based version, a fillable form, or a PDF. Okay, cool. And um, final question was, can we submit an application via Express Mail instead of DocX? Uh, sure you can, but you gotta pay the fee. The $400 fee, 200 or 100. All right, it looks like uh, Dan Oster, Osterkamp, put in the link to the uh, after party. I think I have that here too. And there's, I'll add the password into that too. And um, I think if that's all, we can head over there and, and see if anyone wants to, to join in. Um, were there any at the beginning I missed? Sorry, I wasn't following these along as, as we went, but. I guess that's all for now. And stop And sharing. everybody, we will email a link with a copy of the recording and the slide decks um, after the end of this. So there's no need to worry that you will have a copy of this. Okay. We'll, we'll leave that up and uh, for a while, I guess, and I'll uh, I'm going to head over to the uh, to the after party for uh, people to commiserate. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.